Hello and welcome to the Leaders' Council podcast with me, Scott Chaloner. This podcast, just like the Leaders' Council itself, is all about recognising and celebrating those people who keep this great country running. We exist to give leaders a voice outside of their own organisations and to support them in the same way that they support their staff every single day of the week. Now, if you are in a leadership role yourself and would like to have your voice heard on the national stage, then please do visit leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply. Now, joining me on today's programme on what is another warm summer morning here in the capital is Simeon Quarry. Simeon is a business educator, mentor, keynote speaker, and CEO and founder of Vivida. Vivida is a team of storytellers led by Simeon, combining storytelling with gamification, high production video and immersive content to create experiences with the power to change minds and behaviours. Uh, Simeon, very warm welcome to yourself today, and thank you so much for joining us on the show. No, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure, Simeon. Certainly is another warm day for it, isn't it? Now, um, yeah. on this podcast, we talk an awful lot about leadership and something that we've quite well established over the course of the last 16 months, let's say, is the importance of learning within leadership. We're never the finished article as leaders, are we? And I think that the COVID-19 pandemic has certainly reminded us that every single day is a school day within business. And it's been a learning curve for so, so many as we've had to pivot and adapt at an unprecedented scale to sort of just get through this crisis to date and keep vital services ticking over. And that has lit a fire under something called digital learning. And just looking at some figures from LinkedIn, actually, 75% of learning and development professionals say that community-based learning is now more important to their businesses than ever before the coronavirus pandemic hit. And 94% actually agree that teams that can learn together are ultimately far more successful for that. Um, Further to that, a third of business leaders are saying that reskilling and upskilling employees is a top priority for 2021. So what we're essentially seeing here, aren't we, is the environment that companies are operating in is undergoing rapid change and business is adapting to the new settings by upskilling their digital aptitude. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think that um, whenever you go through a fast uh, iterative, iterative change, it's very, very easy to get it wrong. It's also very easy to be left behind. And that's where that kind of leadership component comes comes in you know we have to make the right decisions at the right time but then the key thing is is we have to find ways of making sure that we bring everybody in an organization um, along with us um, and the larger the organization um, sometimes that's harder um, because there's more people um, or there's a culture that has to be changed um, other times um, you know there is this, those communication conduits that are already in place to enable those messages to, to reach um, that you know their staff, um, but when it comes to what we've seen over the period of the you know the, the pandemic, um, we've had to adapt. Organisations have to have had to adapt the way that they um, speak to their people and their colleagues, and the way they keep their people up to date. And when it comes to sort of education and upskilling into that sort of new digital environment, there's a lot to learn, isn't there, when it comes to home working? It's not just a case of taking your laptop and your work phone home and just doing things as normal. There's a whole plethora of new challenges, particularly with regard to security, despite the many positives that we've seen about home working. So as good as it's been, what are some of those sort of key security challenges, do you think, that businesses do need to be very mindful of? So I think in a way we've got two points there. Um, I, I think the the first point which you touched on, which is 100% correct, is, is that um, learning at home isn't the same as learning when you are in the business. I think the expectations of um, colleagues and peers within an organization ends up being higher because they end up sitting in an environment whereby, you know, on one hand they've got an iPad with Netflix um, and then, you know, someone else in the household has got sort of maybe, I don't know, a gaming console, um, for example, like the expectations of um, content in the home is higher than when you're sitting uh, inside a, a corporate office. So that's been one challenge um, that the pandemic's brought. But the point you mentioned is, is, is totally correct, is that now we have um, uh, colleagues, staff members working from home, all of a sudden, there are these new sets of risks because the technology and the infrastructure um, 
now is being used in a in a different context. Um, you know, you may have family members that've got access to the to the work devices, um, which poses a particular risk. Maybe the what we would call the you know the, the network and the Wi-Fi connections, etc., may not be as secure as they would be um, uh, in in the office. Mm-hmm. And just the other methods that criminals use, criminals are typically trying to catch people out on the spur of the moment by just getting them to click on something that they maybe should, that they definitely shouldn't click on. Um, and that's, it's easy to be distracted at times at home because we are jumping in and out of different contexts. We, we, we jump from being a um, maybe a business leader or an operator within a business to being a father to being a um a husband or a wife or a mother or a sister or a brother. And all of a sudden, that change of context brings with it a level of risk because you end up making decisions very quickly. And when it comes to clicking on the wrong link, which is a technique that criminals are using to, um, uh, you know, with this new trend of ransomware that's mm. really been on, on the uptake where um, a, a malicious piece of software gets downloaded when someone clicks on a link and then it starts to lock down an, in, an organization's computer system. Um, you know, that's a, this is a real risk that's there at the moment. And when it comes to sort of that kind of digital learning about those risks that come from the blurring of sort of work and home life, um, your business, Vivida, actually has designed an immersive learning experience, which really takes people in depth at the risks of a typical home office, haven't you? Uh, I think it'd be good to sort of give the listeners a little bit of insight on that without giving too much away, of course. Yeah, sure. No problem. I, you know, I, I think that the, the first point for us that we, we spoke about, about making sure that education and learning is engaging is, um, you know, Vivida's core mandate. Mm-hmm. Uh, we look for subjects that are vitally important to individuals within organizations with an aim of creating a culture, right? Um and changing culture. So, for example, a having a security-minded culture, a secure culture, is very, very important. And it's even more important now um, as people work from home and also in the office. So what we've done is we decided to um, move away from the plain white background, clip art style um, text, imagery in a a very boring type of education and training and look at how we can use our core skills of storytelling, um, interactivity um, and content creation to create gamified experiences that help people understand um, these key subjects. Um, Many call this uh, security awareness, um, essentially. The, The aim is, is you need to make sure that all of your staff members are um, aware of the risks. Um, some organisations, that's uh, you know, they, they for, because of regulation, they have to do that. Others are now realising it's vitally important because they're watching their companies being attacked by criminals and seeing, um, you know, peers or CEOs and leaders and other organisations being affected by this. And this is huge rush at the moment to make sure that people understand. So, for example, um, we've created a, a working from home interactive module where you interactively find yourself um, in a, um, you know, a home, a hollow deck, as it were, with mm-hmm. um, a, a simulation of a home where you have to quickly identify uh, the risks against the clock. But then we start to break down um, what those risks are and then how to mitigate them to protect the family, but also protect the organization and the organization's assets as well. And that's just one kind of um, module and one subject. There are so many key principles related to security that organizations need to make sure that their staff understand um, because it's better that an organization invest in educating their staff um, rather than um, pay the criminals when they have locked down an entire business um, and are asking for a ransom. It is, isn't it? And I think it's a much better way um, of actually getting that information across to employees, isn't it? Rather than just sending them looking through reams of worksheets or just watching instructional videos. We have to really stress that video learning isn't just about sort of just watching videos on YouTube, is it? It's about those immersive experiences 
gamifying the experiences, giving people sort of a new kind of challenge looking into. And it's working really well. I mean, the statistics show that people who sort of engage with digital scenarios like that are actually taking on board the information a lot better. And I think if we compare that to sort of traditional classroom environments, it resonates a lot more in particular with this current generation, you know, millennials, Generation Z, who are a lot more sort of technically astute. Yeah, you're you're you're, you're absolutely um, correct there because you know I struggled with learning when I was growing up, and it was largely because the content was really boring. And as a result, like many of you listeners, if you are bored in class, you are at the back of the class misbehaving. And um, even if you have got the ability to, um, you know, to, to, to get on and, and, and make it happen, so now making sure that the training and education is something that is designed, as you say, um, for the current generation. Um, that's key because you know I think we well I know that we we made the um, the interactive modules for ITV ITV used our um, you know our, all of our um, cyber security um, training uh, modules across the organisation um, and uh, of course as a, as an organisation ITV don't want content that's bland and that's boring because they 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 work in keeping people entertained keeping people engaged. Um, and it was totally transformative because it was the first time that they'd had modules that people actually really engaged with and enjoyed. But off the back of the enjoyment, what we're actually doing as well is we are providing an organization with data that can then be used to um, understand the, um, the, the, you know, the areas of risk and then start to make specific um, improvements in those areas or double down on those areas where members of an organization um, struggle. Um, so that's been key. Um, other organizations like Lloyd's Banking Group, we kind of worked with two sets of technology. One was um, virtual reality, where we actually physically, well, not physically, we virtually place people within an environment to learn um, with a headset. And then also that working from home module that you were, you were speaking about. Mm. And so we're seeing two different types of organizations there, right? We've both realized that it's vitally important to make sure that people are um, engaged. And the reason being is, is that we've heard so much about COVID this and, you know, we've heard figures and statistics where we're constantly being bombarded with negative, negative information, whereby um, on a psychological um, level, we are just constantly triaging risk and we're almost fatigued with this. You know, do we go into an environment because there's too many people? Should we wear a mask? Should we not wear a mask? Um, vaccines, lateral flow tests. So then here we come along with a subject like cybersecurity, whereby inherently it's very similar. It's about risks. It's about, you know, um, criminals. It's about, and if we're not careful, we can add to the weight um, and the anxiety that individuals have when they're at home. And that's where the storytelling um, mm -hmm. And making things enjoyable becomes so important because I don't want to um, add to the anxiety that people have got. And that's why doing things in the right way um, is absolutely key. So it seems very clear to me that what business leaders need to do is instill a culture of learning to make their businesses safe and successful. And this is a very good avenue to sort of go about doing that. Now, a huge well, part... Your... Yeah. Yep. Sorry, just to, to buy in there, because you, you mean, you know, that I love what you said there about kind of creating a culture of learning. That's what's been very difficult, mm. because it, how do you create a culture where people want to learn if the content is really drab, really dry, and very boring? You, you can send out emails and go do this, you know, take this learning, go through this test of, you know, 18 questions, um, and it, you can't you can't do that unless the content is right. and. Um, I'll be honest with you, it's been very difficult um, trying to um, change the production levels within the industry. Um, I can understand why people have done it in a very straightforward, very quick production method that almost has no production value. But we kind of just felt that it's absolutely necessary. And even though it is more difficult, the benefits in the long run, when you see people smiling or enjoying and learning is key. And one of the things you mentioned at the very beginning of the um, discussion was the statistics around um, team working. Mm. Um, 
And that's one of the things that we've now actually really um, started to focus on. Um, we're actually now working on um, the principle of online interactive escape rooms to educate team members. So take, for example, cybersecurity. Um, can we take a group of people within organizations through um, the equivalent of mandatory learning in a group scenario that's gamified, that feels like an escape room, whereby we're essentially taking the carrots and creating a carrot cake, but we're also at the same time instilling key principles, checking whether the team understand those concepts with scores and gamification, and then also um, doing polls and quizzes dur during that escape room so that then an organization's got real tangible data, evidence that one and organize that the people understand, but also data on those areas whereby there may be more risk that can be doubled down on. So mm. we're really now focusing in line, ironically, with what you started off the conversation with, with trying to solve that problem of how can we create team learning that is enjoyable, that works with this blended working, those working from home and also in the office, even at the same time. Exactly right. And I think also a big part of instilling that culture of learning as well is that business leaders also have to show a willingness, don't they, to give their employees that time on the company clock to go and access courses, get onto this content, connect with people, and even do something as simple as sort of reflect on a business meeting or a debrief after doing one of these courses and what they can sort of take away from that. Um, do you sort of think that that's happening enough? Do you think that business leaders are setting enough time aside to encourage their employees to, you know, go and do this course, go and access that resource, go and really learn something because we're going to need this as a business moving forward. I think that businesses are. I think the challenge is, is having enough, um, creating enough desire in the learners, in mm. the, um, you know, the colleagues and peers within an organization to actually do it. Um, you either force people and you make it mandatory, but then when they get there, it's dry and everyone goes through it and it just feels like a chore. So then the appetite to voluntary learning is totally destroyed, which is why there has to be this focus on creating learning that's um, engaging. Um, so I think the key difficulty is at the moment is most organizations are happy for their people to learn, but um, ask your people to learn and most will carry on with the task list that they've got at hand that they feel like they get paid for. So we have to work to change that dynamic so that people want to. So, for example, if all of a sudden I said, hey, um, you and your team want to come and do an online escape room, gonna just a, just an hour meeting, up, you know, maybe 45 minutes, um, the likelihood is you're, you're going to get a, yeah, cool, okay, yeah, we'll do that. And that is your actual education, um, learning those core concepts. You just totally change the dynamic um, of the way that people um, learn within organizations. Exactly. I think that change is incredibly important. And I think we can use the COVID-19 pandemic as a watershed moment for real change, um, not just in sort of society at large, but also within sort of industry very specifically at the macro level. And what I mean by that is that, Businesses right now are looking for people to develop their sort of hard technological skills, like sort of learning to code, for instance. But um, mm -hmm. it's also that sort of emphasis on developing emotional intelligence, awareness of risk. But another key aspect as well is sort of improving inclusion and diversity within businesses, because there's been a great deal of social inequality exposed by the pandemic. And that's something as well that at Vivida and within yourself, Simeon, you're also very passionate about, aren't you? Absolutely. I think that, um, um, you know, your, your listeners can't, maybe can't tell, possibly can't from my voice. I'm a, I'm a black man. Um, and um, as a, you know, an entrepreneur, um, you know, fighting um, to be uh, successful and, um, and have real impact in the world, there's a, there has been a massive challenge there. Um, and uh, it hasn't been something I've been very comfortable about talking about. In fact, most of the time, the way we deal with it as a culture is, um, you know, get your head down um, and um, just work, you know, quadruply as hard. Um, what we have seen over the recent um, couple of years, um, particularly after um, George Floyd's um, uh, death, 
um, is that people have been more open, um, as in you know, black people, for example, have been more open about talking. Um, and, and as a result, others, um, you know, um, Asian cultures, and it's just become this period whereby the conversation that we have um, is, is different to what we've had before. And it's almost like we've started to peel the, the layer um, back and reveal um, challenges within organizations um, and systematic challenges within organizations that um, need to be um, focused on and concentrated on. Um, one, because um, you know the challenges that are there shouldn't be there, but also because it makes good business sense. And it takes leadership from the front to um, genuinely and empathetically decide that um, change is going to happen, it has to happen, and that it can happen. And um, education um, has a role to say to, to play in that as well. And that is a challenge that we um, are um, you know, definitely dedicated to um, at, at Bavida. And it's great to see that a number of organizations um, are really starting to take this subject uh, very seriously. It is, isn't it? And as we sort of enter this period now where restrictions from sort of the COVID uh, situation have sort of gone for now um, in England at least, and we're starting to embrace maybe the challenges of the post-pandemic, trying to sort of get on a level footing with the rest of the world, try and sort of alleviate the virus as an immediate danger and enter a period of real recovery. Um, what are some of your sort of ambitions and priorities going to be over the next 12 months as Vivi, um, at Vivida as hopefully we sort of capitalise on the opportunity that the pandemic has given us and really use this as a moment to drive forward that meaningful change? Yeah, on a personal level, um, uh, as a leader, it's this situation. I think, in the as challenging as it was, there was a moment um, uh, as a, as a business when the pandemic hit, and we were focused very much on only virtual reality. Mm. That there was a, just a moment of panic, um, we followed by immediate action that enabled um, myself to kind of come up with some ideas and concepts that we put to the team. And over the course of you know the last year, we've developed new products. Um, new offerings that actually um, are it's forcing us to make decisions that we probably should have made um, earlier um, but like many when you're forced through this process of rapid um, innovation and we thought we were being innovative with virtual reality but we're now being forced through it um, we actually come out in a more exciting position so now we we focus on um, helping organizations um, uh, really adapt um, their learning so that it works for those that um, are working both at home and at work. So this is not about um, things aren't going to be exactly the same again. We have a more flexible um, working environment, which um, is very promising. If, if flexibility is offered, um, you know, there are new challenges, but there are brilliant new opportunities. And we're really excited um, about helping organizations um, lean into that. Yeah, it's going to be a fantastic uh, time of plenty of opportunity and seriously wish you all the luck in the world in capitalizing that and really helping educate these businesses moving forward, Simeon. And I've got to say, I've thoroughly enjoyed having you on the program with us today. It's a shame we're just about out of time because I could literally discuss the topic with you all day. And I think as we start to understand more about what this sort of post-pandemic period hopefully is going to start looking like, providing restrictions don't come back. Um, I'd love to sort of welcome you back onto the program and just sort of catch up as to how far we've come maybe in sort of seven or eight months and just see how that fantastic mission that you're on at Vivida is going. I'd absolutely love that. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure, Simeon. And lastly, just before we do depart, please do take care and stay safe with all still going on because it's clear we're not out of the woods yet, but fingers crossed that better days are certainly ahead of us. Absolutely. It was a pleasure to welcome Simeon Quarry, CEO of Vida, onto the programme today. 
And of course, here on the Leaders' Council podcast, we like to bring forward a variety of distinct perspectives on leadership and therefore we'll be joined by former England cricket captain Sir Andrew Strauss next on the programme. Uh, during his playing days, Sir Andrew actually became just one of three England captains to have secured the Ashes both at home and away in Australia, as well as racking up the second highest number of test victories for an England skipper in history. And I do hope that you enjoy listening to his perspective on leadership just as much as my colleague relished the opportunity to speak with him that will be coming up on the program shortly hello and welcome i'm jonathan white and today we are joined by sir andrew strauss former captain of the england cricket team and former director of cricket at the ecb sir andrew thank you very much for joining us today real pleasure to be here thank you the pleasure is all of ours you know and you've had a distinguished career as i said both on and off the pitch in english cricket recognized not least with your knighthood for services to sport, so congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, there have been ups and downs in the career, like any career, including public and private disagreements with certain individuals. And on that front, I think what everybody wants to know, have you finally forgiven Marcus Dressed Gothic for giving you that stupid Lord Brockett nickname? <laughs> um, well, m- my recollection was that it wasn't Marcus Dressed Gothic who gave me that nickname. Ah. It was actually Mark Butcher. Uh, He's but to blame. You know, I think there were a lot of people. It was the senior England teams at the mo- mm. at that time who wanted to sort of put me in my place and make sure that I didn't get above my station. So um, uh, thankfully, it didn't particularly <laughs> stick, other than within those group of players. And you really did try and get on their nerves by getting above your station, because of course, in your first outing, uh, you went on to score 112. Mm. Now, am I right in saying this, perhaps, that you only got there because Michael Vaughan did himself an injury? Well, that was the reason I got on the pitch in the yes. first place. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's often sort of misunderstood or misjudged the role that luck plays in a in an international career or sporting career full stop. And, um, you know, I was wait, waiting patiently in the wings mm. for an opportunity and it didn't really seem like an opportunity was going to come along. And then you know, I only got injured in the nets and there was my chance and I had to kind of grab it with both hands if I could. And you certainly did. What was it like then to uh, see your name being put up on the Lord's Honour Board after your first appearance? Yeah, look, I'd just been transported to a completely different world almost. I'd been, I was a Middlesex player, I was mm. captain of Middlesex. All my focus was on helping Middlesex sort of win the championship and whatever. And then a week later... I've scored a test century, which is something I'd always dreamed out you know, literally all my life. And then the thought of doing it at Lords in your first test. I mean, it was literally the dream. So, And then suddenly I started thinking, wow, hold on. Not, potentially I've got a whole England career ahead of me and everything that entails. So it was a real shock to the system. Um, but I suppose what I was grateful for was that I was rel- relatively old, probably not the right way of putting it, but I was 27 of years course. of age. I was pretty comfortable with my own game. And I was also, I think, mature enough to understand um, that this was a great opportunity for me, but not to get carried away with it, which is unfortunately what happens with a lot of younger players. Without a doubt. And I think in those early years of your career, it's so important. I think you'd agree, especially when you're learning from other more experienced people. And this can be true of any field, whether it's sports or politics or business. Um to have somebody there that you can rely on or look up to for guidance. In those early days, was there somebody that you could say to this day that, thank goodness they were there for you? Uh, Well, I think in preparing me for international cricket, Justin Langer was a massive um, Mm. source of advice for me. So he was captain of Millsets a couple of years beforehand and really helped me understand what I needed to do to get there. Um, But then I think on the day-to-day basis... My wife, Ruth, played a huge mm. role, you know, and just in terms of because I, th- I think there is that real danger that you get carried away with it. And you think yes. international sport in that goldfish bowl that, you know, you're more important than you, you were previously or that that whole world is the real world. And, uh, and obviously all we know is that the real world, nothing's changed other than mm-hmm. other people's perception of you. And you need that grounding. And again, that can be true of any, uh, so many different areas of life. I think so, yeah. I, I mean, very easy to get caught up in it and end up doing different things, being with different people, sort of trying to enjoy 
everything that goes with international cricket rather than focusing on the actual international it's cricket. And itself. in those early days, Andrew, there were lots of examples where you could have got carried away because that team accomplished so much. Um, I think for a lot of people, the 2005 Ashes series is one of the greatest sporting moments of this country's history. Now, we could chat for hours about that, but I know uh, I wouldn't be allowed to, and, and, and you've got <laughs> other places to be, so <laughs> we can't do that. But I, if I may, I would love to ask what your highlight was personally for that, but perhaps more importantly, um, as a team, how were you able as a group to deal with the pressure no doubt you were feeling? Yeah, well, the the pressure was like nothing else that I experienced before or after because, you know, I think it's easy to forget how how much of a holy grail the Ashes was mm. back then. You know, we hadn't won it for so long and it seemed like we'd come up against these invincible Australian teams year after year. So, you know, the, the closer we got to it, the harder it became. Um, I remember Ashley Giles walking into the dressing room, for the f- I think it was in final day of the series and I looked at him and he looked absolutely terrible <laughs> like just white of a sheet gray he looked like aged about five years I went god Charlie you're not looking too good and he went yeah it's not surprising I haven't slept for eight weeks <laughs> and I went well join the club you Quite. know and I think we'd all been sort of living this behind our own closed doors and um yeah it, it just an extraordinary thing and uh, without doubt the the highlight was Number one, drawing that game at the Oval yes. to make sure we 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 won the Ashes, but also the day after, you know, that open top bus parade around London, and to understand that we'd broken out of the cricket bubble, that they're just general sports fans or just people that were interested in in seeing England win at something were all engaged and uh, completely besotted by the whole thing. I think that's such a key point, Andrew, because there's there's so there were so many people back in 2005 that may have not even given cricket a second glance and it put a whole new generation especially of children and school kids into loving that sport and so beyond the actual competition itself what a fantastic thing to be able to say was accomplished for, for absolutely uh, uh, everything you say there is absolutely right like we, we just sort of opened the doors of cricket to a whole new generation but probably more importantly it was the one and only time in my life that I got papped outside a nightclub that <laughs> night when we were celebrating. You know, I felt like I'd really arrived well as a done. celebrity. Yes. <laughs> it only happened for that one night, unfortunately. But I, I did ask for a highlight, and if you didn't perhaps give a specific one on the pitch, uh, uh, so I would suggest perhaps that catch at Trent Bridge. No, no, <laughs> no. I mean, the, the catch at Trent Bridge was, uh, you know. You see a ball, you stick out your hand, and it goes in. I, I think um, my personal highlight was I scored 100 in that fifth test yes. match under real pressure, and that that was one that you know that that wasn't a moment. That was a, a number of hours, and I had to dig pretty deep to do that. Now, obviously, not that long later, uh, as you were lucky enough and the privilege, I'm sure, no doubt, to serve as captain. And whether you like it or not, you become the focal point of criticism. Uh, you looked on up to and relied upon to be strong, especially when the going gets tough. You become a leader in many senses of the word. Uh, during your time as captain, Andrew, what qualities does one require to fulfil that role? Ha. Um, well, a fair amount of resilience for starters. Mm. You know, you're absolutely right. You, you know, I, I remember when I, I got the role, it, it did feel like biggest sort of poison chalice of all time and that you know <laughs> yes. sort of a litany of England captains had sort of been churned up by the job prior to me taking over so th- there was that sort of realization this is going to be a tough thing to do um and you're gonna have to dig pretty deep but I think actually the most important thing was sort of just pushing all that noise to one side and just clarifying okay if I'm going to do this job what is it that we really want to achieve out of this? Mm. And so you, th- suddenly that becomes a bit more exciting and a bit more enticing, the idea of, well, we can do something that's never been done before here, and I've got the opportunity to to play my part in that. So, um, you know, I think that, w- that was a big part of it for me. Um, you know, I think a lot of those qualities around leadership, I don't think you know you have them until you're in that situation, Absolutely. and it's very hard to prepare yourself properly for those sort of situations. Um, and when managing a team, uh, you're required to manage, of course, what some people could call big personalities. Others could use 
different thought of words. <laughs> How poisonous can it be, players, when players, and indeed, and this applies again to so many different areas of life, when individuals um, think they are perhaps more important than, than a team? Well, I, I think probably worth broadening out that a bit. You know, I, I think there, there are all sorts of different people that you have to um, sort of contend with in a team environment. And uh, the job of the leadership or the management is to, tr to try and sort of gel them all together and get them bought into what you're trying to do and whatever. So, you know, th there are some people that are a bit more self-absorbed. There's some people that are slightly more maverick in the, the way they, they view the world. Um, there's some people that are very quiet. Uh, there's some people that are, you know, p perhaps very worried about what might go wrong. Uh, and so you've got to try and mm. understand all these people individually and try and get the best out of them. Um, but, th th yeah, there was definitely a line there for me in terms of um, embracing difference up to the point where someone doing following their agenda was going in a completely different path from the team's agenda. And, you know, if and when that happens, that that should be a problem for a leadership. And if it isn't a problem, then you're not doing your but job. Absolutely. Um, and w with all that in mind, actually, uh, and perhaps this is a bit of a wing question, but what advice would you give to others in a similar position, leading a team, um, being looked up to? What would be the key advice you'd give to them? And that you couldn't really do without it. Just generally about leading I, I a team. I think so, yes. Okay, uh, number one thing about leadership, I'm absolutely certain about this, is that the people you're leading need to know that you care about them. Mm. And if, if they genuinely believe you've got their best interests at heart, they will forgive all sorts of other inadequacies you might have. And I definitely had many. Um, because they, they'll know your heart's in the right place and they, uh, they'll they feel comforted. There'll be a degree of sort of psychological safety or some, or whatever it might you might term to, to make sure that the, the team comes together when the going gets tough. If they genuinely don't believe you care about them and you're in it for yourself, um, it doesn't matter how charismatic you might be. It doesn't matter, you know, how gregarious and, and how... Um, impressive you might be as a person they will be wary of you mm. and they will start looking after their own interests very quickly um now in 2015 obviously you were appointed as director of the ecb uh you took some pretty uh major steps early on um you brought in trevor bayliss as coach was always brought in um you put a much greater emphasis on limited overs cricket now in the abstract what had you identified that needed to be changed um, for English cricket? And were there qualities that you had developed, you'd found out you had as England captain, that you were able to bring over the job? Um, okay, so the first thing was we had this unbelievable opportunity of the World Cup on Hoyam Sol in yes. 2019. Uh, I was, firstly, I was sick and tired of watching us make the same mistakes in World Cups, and this includes my time as captain. We just kept it on sleepwalking our way into it and pretending everything would be on the all right mm. on the night and it never was. Um, and so I definitely made it our priority to win that 2019 World Cup. I thought that was more important than anything else that was going to be taking place in my tenure. Um, and I knew in order to do that, we had to completely shift our perception of white ball cricket. Quite a radical shift from what we, we, what we were coming from. Yeah, but mm. the rest of the game had moved on. And yeah. the rest of the game had understood that white ball cricket was playing an increasingly important role in, in both financially, but also in in terms of players' focus and interest. Yes. Um, and we had to move... With, in fact, we didn't have to move at the times. We need to get ahead of the time. <laughs> so, you know, we had to completely shift out both our philosophy, but also the way we played in order to do that. Um, and I was very lucky uh, having both Trevor Bayliss and Owen Morgan who were prepared to sort of role model that and lead that through um and the second part of your question around what did the england captaincy sort of done to prepare me for the role i, I think i was comfortable leading i was i knew mm. the environment i knew what i was getting myself into and, and in the early days i could leverage some of the relationships that i had with the players but actually i found it a very different challenge because you are 
so so far removed from what's going on on the ground, right. and so you know you're relying on other people to have to buy into what you want to happen and then do it themselves mm. and often you know in different time zones in different parts of the world so that was that was a very new experience for me well i think the strategy paid off and uh, i don't know about you but when watching that world cup final again as so many people did in this country it's once again it inspired another generation of uh, especially school kids who again might not have given cricket a second look who have now become Avid cricket fans, I know of some, it, and it, what what a wonderful thing that must be. Yeah, it was an incredible day, wasn't it? I mean, I think in our vision, like when we we're talking about the opportunity of winning the 2019 World Cup, I had this vision in my mind of Lords on a sunny day and a close finish and the incredible kind of you know emotion that went with it. Mm. No one could have dreamt no. how it played out. I've never seen anything. I've never seen a game of cricket like that in my whole life, and for it to be. The World Cup final was quite extraordinary. I know some fantastically avid cricket fans who were googling there and then what exactly the rules became because I yeah, well, so was, <laughs> was I actually, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, now, Andrew, in your in your wife's memory, you established the Ruth Strauss Foundation last year. Uh, in doing so, whether you'd admit it or not, yourself and the foundation has become an inspiration to thousands: husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters. Please do take some time, if you wouldn't mind, and you. To explain to the listeners the work the foundation does and and what it's been like to lead a project like that. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, look, I mean, we obviously had a very tough journey as a family. First of all, Ruth being diagnosed, Ruth was someone that was always well. You never think she was going to be someone that was sort of laid down by cancer. And for us to find out that she had lung cancer was mm. extraordinary. She'd never smoked a, a cigarette in her life. And I think we all had this perception of lung cancer being a smoker's disease. Um, and so just uh, having gone through the experience and obviously some very low times and us coming to terms with the fact that, that Ruth had stage four cancer and she was going to die, um, we learned a lot in that process. And, and thankfully, we had time for me to speak to Ruth before she died about legacy and what we could do to make something positive come out of you know this experience we'd all been through. So after she died in December uh, 2018, uh, I came back and launched the foundation with two focuses. Number one, to fund research into these rare forms of lung cancer. These Mm. are the non-smoking lung cancers. Um, Five to 7,000 people each year in this country are diagnosed with these. No one knows why they're getting them, um, but they're on the increase, and it's women young women that are affected more than men. Extraordinary so, numbers. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in the list of top 10 cancers, it's number eight. Rare forms right. of lung cancer, number eight. So it's not really rare, it's probably a misnomer, but it's, um, yeah, we're really lacking in funding and understanding. And then the second element, and probably this is in some ways more pressing, is um, to help uh, cancer, anyone who's got cancer who has an incurable uh, diagnosis to help them and their families prepare themselves for death mm. and so in order to do that we need to be able to find ways of them having open conversations with each other because if you do this well it should help the bereavement afterwards if you're well prepared for it it's not something people like to do i was very lucky that ruth wanted to do it um but also we have to have that debate about about the taboo of death and yes. you know effectively how uncomfortable we are talking about it and certainly how bad we are preparing for it. If you, if you think for a moment about antenatal casters before you have your mm. baby, like how we're preparing you for the, how your life's going to change and we do nothing around death, even though we're all going to experience it in one shape, way, shape or form. And, um, you know, we, I think as a society we need to be better than that. We, we've come a long way in so many different areas and especially around mental health. And we can do better about death, there's no doubt about it. Well, I think the the foundation is leading the way in breaking taboos on that front because they need to be broken. Um, uh, I know they've got, the foundation is going at some events there, so if you could tell us about some of those, that would be... Yeah, so the, I mean, we've got a couple of big ones. So uh, the Westminster Mile, which is a a very inclusive, if you're thinking about, think about a marathon, but just think about just doing a mile of a marathon <laughs> rather than 26. Sounds ideal. So we've got grandparents, we've got little kids, we've got people pushing prams so that we're going to get as many people as possible to play their part in that and raise some funds. 
Um, we've got the Red for Ruth Day at Lords again, so that was an incredible day for us. You could, you, whether you were there or not, especially if you were there, I mean to say, but whether it was the photos in the papers the next day, what an extraordinary, I think it was the 15th of April, wasn't it? What an extraordinary day and what an overwhelming day that must have been for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you know, an Ashes Test match is a big day anyway, yes. and then f- for us to have that extra element of the, the Red for Ruth Day and to see the the wave of support you know it's probably it was just i myself and the boys were incredibly profoundly affected by that uh, in a good way you know felt so much uh, love and support there and then the foundation is directly benefited hugely by the the funds raised and um we want to take it up a year and, and make it more of a community thing not just the the day at lords um i even saw some of the stuffiest members of the mcc and you're wearing red uh, wearing red so what w- what an extraordinary thing yeah well a lot uh, of them <laughs> wear red trousers <laughs> they, anyway no, i think but um <laughs> no it, absolutely you know they, they were right behind us and um you know we, we really want that to be something that's embedded in in the english summer uh just like the mcgrath foundation days yes. in, in sydney and australia well it's been a complete inspiration um and uh i very much hope we can talk about that perhaps late in a few months as well absolutely. um before we go, as I'm conscious of the time, we uh, it's also an exciting year for domestic cricket, um, not least uh, because of the introduction of the 100, not without its critics, though, I should. Andrew, I know you're uh, a big proponent of it. Um, the Blast has clearly shown um, that the short form of the game has brought cricket to a new and growing audience, exciting games. Uh, what do you say to those that ask, why do we need the 100 as well? Uh, well... So the 100 is the most important uh, step forward in domestic cricket in this country ever. And the reason for that is that increasingly, well, there's two things. First of all, we need to break out of the cricket bubble. So the blast followers tend to be the same people that follow other cricket. Right. And therefore, you know, that's a small audience, mm-hmm. and potentially a, a declining one over time, even though the bra- blast sales are increasing. Uh, we need to break out of that and try and get more general sports fans into cricket. Um, but more importantly, um, just the, the way the tournament's set up and it's one day, one game a day over a six-week period, broadcasters will pay money for that. And therefore, what we're trying to do is re- reduce our reliance on international cricket paying all the bills. If you think about test cricket and some of the issues around the world, we just can't rely on that money coming in mm. to fund the game. So we need to find another way of doing that um, I just think it's going to be an incredible success. I'm so excited about it. I know there are people that are worried about it, but in two or three years' time, um, you know, we're going to have our own uh, short-form tournament that will rival the Big Bash and will be moving towards the IPL. And those are you know, those are two enormous events out there, and we can have our own version of that ourselves. I can feel your enthusiasm for it. As a as an Essex fan, I, I'm still stumped as to, I think I'm going to have to choose between either supporting a team based at the Oval or a team based at Lords. I, I, I'll, I'll get over that, but I'll, I'll yeah, have to do well it. Well, surely it's got to be the Lords one, right? That sh- sh- of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sanjay, it's been an absolute pleasure discussing that and everything else with you today. Thank you very much. Cheers. This has been the Leaders' Council podcast. Thank you for celebrating excellence in leadership with us. I've been your host, Scott Challoner. Until next time, goodbye. Thank you for listening to our podcast. The views expressed within the podcast do not reflect the views of the Leaders' Council of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, its parent company or subsidiaries, members of staff, or other guests of any other person therein associated.